Uh, thank you for the uh, invitation uh, for the organizers of this uh, CASA's annual workshop. Uh, I'm Sivaraj Manikam and uh, I'm from Sandia National Labs. Today I would talk about uh, intersection of machine learning and uh, scientific simulations. Especially I want to talk about um, uh, the some perspectives from architectures and applications. Okay, And I uh, here is the outline of the talk. It's a two-part talk. Uh, one, the first part is focused on applications. Uh, especially, I would like to focus on an application that is related uh, to, uh, to the previous talk as well. Uh, the, it is on using machine learning for an application in the material science domain. Uh, the second uh, topic that I would cover in the second half of the talk is on uh, machine learning architectures uh, and our machine learning accelerators. Uh, that are coming up uh, quite fast and how to co-design algorithms and these architectures um, so that we can use them both for machine learning use cases and for other scientific simulations as well. And finally, I'll end with a few challenges. Okay. So where is the potential for using machine learning uh, in science applications? Uh, you can put them in three big buckets. Uh, there are known algorithms that we use for some uh, science simulations, experiments, uh, and we would uh, want to, and, and they're very expensive. We would want to find surrogate machine learning models or uh, train on smaller models, local methods, and to scale it up, okay, to large model. So that's one approach. Then there are topics that are interesting for us from the science perspective, but the, they are, in terms of patterns, they are very similar to industry. For example, image analysis to find a defect in a part, uh, anomaly detection to find a failing node uh, in an HPC facility, text analysis. So if you have patterns that are already uh, useful, that, that are already shown to be uh, well useful for machine learning, then you use that, uh, you adopt the techniques from the industry has been developing and use that. And finally, there are new application domains, for example, in uh, your physics and machine learning, uh, can you do smart uh, laboratories or smart facilities? How do you incorporate machine learning into these aspects uh, is an interesting problem in itself, okay? <clears throat> and uh, the work that we have been doing at Sandia and I'm, I've been part of, you, you can think of it as four uh, primary uh, sub uh, topics. Uh, one is how to use machine learning uh, within some science application. Uh, I'll talk about that today. Number two is, can you use the hardware accelerators coming out of academia and the industry in order to make machine learning go fast? And uh, can you use it for machine learning uh, that we are interested in and for non-machine learning applications that we are interested in? Okay. So the architectures aspect, I would talk about it. There are new algorithms that we would need and we would uh, like to use those algorithms uh, at our custom develop algorithms for the science use cases. I will not talk about it today uh, due to time. And then there are projects where we build large benchmarks and frameworks, proxy applications that represent uh, uh, science needs. And I'll not talk about that today. Okay, so that is the context. The first uh, half of the talk uh, will be on machine learning, uh, using machine learning in a material science application. Okay. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, several team members. Uh, Attila Kangi, who's uh, leading this uh, session uh, at CASIS, uh, is also part as a collaborator in this project. Austin Ellis, Norman Modine, Adam Stevens, and uh, uh, Aiden Thompson, Alfred Santi are part of the project as well. So the motivation for the project is to do multi-scale materials modeling. And in order to do multi-scale materials modeling, there are several mechanisms uh, you, uh, we, you could use. Uh, for, and uh, we use uh, SNAP that was described in the previous talk, LAMPS related to the previous talk, and DFT codes like quantum espresso or MASP. Okay. And there are a lot of applications to this, uh, to, to this materials modeling for uh, related to what we would like to do at Sentia, radiation hardening of semiconductors, advanced manufacturing or energetic materials. Okay. 
That said, the calculation themselves are quite expensive. They, they scale n cubed to the number a bar n is the number of atoms. So you cannot do this for very large systems and that is a limitation, okay? But despite this limitation, you can see that uh, the number of site, the bottom right here shows the number of citations to DFT um, uh, since early nineties to uh, sometime in 2011. And you can see the uh, number of papers that cite or use these uh, methods. Uh, if you use that as a benchmark, then uh, it's growing quite fast. Okay, it's, it's heavily used, but quite expensive. So our goal is to develop a machine learning approach, machine learning model uh, that acts as a surrogate for this first principle uh, DFT data generation. Uh, and the bumper sticker on the bottom shows why this problem is um, important uh, and how hard this problem is as taken from the DOE AI for Science report uh, that came out uh, last year. And uh, here is a workflow that we are interested in in the project uh, that I lead. So we have, uh, we are given a configuration of atoms uh, on, the, on the left side here, okay. We're given a configuration of atoms from that configuration of atoms, you want to go to a fingerprint and uh, you, you might remember this from the previous talk, this is the snap fingerprint. Could, snap fingerprint could be used as one possible option here. There could be other options you could use. Then you do this DFT calculation that you would want. And the goal of the project is to replace that with a machine learning uh, DFT. And then you want to extend this to, uh, to mesoscale or macro scale where you do MD simulations on top of the energy and forces you have calculated using the machine learning approach, or you do equation of state calculations uh, on top of the energy and forces that you have calculated. And you go extend this all the way to device level simulations. So that is the goal of the project. The talk here is going to focus primarily, or at least the first half of the talk here, is going to focus primarily up to calculating energy and forces. I'm not aware, in fact, we haven't done uh, the rest of the half. The, this is a new project. So this is sort of a motivational slide, but we've done, we've reached halfway there. We haven't reached <clears throat> to the end. Uh, and there are, you would, the other point I want to make is the training data generation in this project is quite expensive because you are going to replace DFT calculation with a circuit, which means your training data is a DFT calculation itself. Uh, so it, that is quite expensive. And then you have to train on it uh, and training is expensive. Uh, so you want to train on, you don't want to train on redundant data. You don't want to train um, uh, on uh, like more and overfit some data that you don't want to do. So we have this experimental design backflow where we want to choose where we train on and what configurations or snapshots that we would like to train on and train, generate that training data and then train on only that. Okay, so I, I wanna highlight that point as well. Okay, there is some past work uh, on this topic. Uh, the most related uh, or closely related work works are listed here. Uh, there is a lot of work that uh, came in previous talk uh, that is related to ML for interatomic potentials. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that portion. I'm, I'm not gonna touch uh, the ML for interatomic potentials. We are thinking about ML for DFT calculations and the closest work to our approach is this paper from Georgia Tech in 2019. Uh, it uh, stopped short of uh, predicting energies and forces. It, it predicted with this quantity of interest called LDOS or local density of states. It didn't do the uh, energy and force calculation and I'll show you in a minute um, the energy and force calculations that we have uh, done. Uh, and, and there are other differences uh, compared to this approach, but that's uh, one main result uh, compared in terms of what you achieve in the end, right? Uh, and then there are these two papers by Brockhart et al. and Lee et al. that are two-stage approaches similar to us. I'll talk about it in a minute, uh, but they replace the second step with something different, okay? And the main differentiator for our approach versus a lot of other approaches is number one, it is a grid-based approach, okay? Uh, which means a lot of data, okay? Uh, which leads to the third point actually, uh, which requires an HPC usage and throughput, uh, 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 high throughput. 
So this requires a lot of scalability and performance work that needs to be done. And then we are focused on materials as opposed to molecules. There is a lot of work on, work on molecules uh, in the past, okay? So here is the uh, feature and data generation uh, aspects uh, where you uh, want, what are the inputs for the fingerprints? Well, what are the input for the machine learning model? Uh, and what are the output for the, what is the output for the machine learning model? Okay. And uh, you are given an atomic configuration like in the right, uh, top right. Uh, and then from there, you calculate these snap fingerprints. And snap fingerprints, as you saw in the previous talk, is atom-centered, okay? So what we've done in this project is to take this snap fingerprint, you extended it to do grid-centered uh, uh, fingerprints, so that you, if you place a grid of 200 by 200 by 200 on this space, you can find a snap fingerprint in each of those grid points, and that's number one. And this is, of course, available. You can uh, access it through the LAMPS Python interface. So that snap fingerprint is rotationally invariant due to construction. And that gives us the rotational invariance we are looking for in terms of the machine learning model. Number two, we go, uh, we calculate the outputs that we want to do. And this is uh, the local density of state outputs. And in the, we do this using quantum espresso and uh, the, uh, material of interest uh, for this particular talk is aluminum. And uh, here's one configuration I gave as an example. It's like 256 atoms at ambient temperature. We also, I'll also show some results with a uh, higher temperature um, in a moment. Uh, and we use this Gaussian smearing to calculate these LDOS. So we calculate these LDOS vector in each grid point. And it looks like the uh, figure on the bottom, okay. Uh, there are three LDOS uh, vectors that we are showing there. And the snap fingerprint is based on a, a cutoff value uh, around the neighborhood of influence. And uh, that is our input and the LDOS values are our output, okay? With that, we have, um, what we can do is we can uh, use this input and output and train a neural network and the neural network here is a standard neural network. It is a feed-forward neural network with five layers in it. And, um, and what we do is we have 10 snapshots of aluminum. Okay. We use one snapshot for training, one for validation, and eight for testing. And each snapshot is roughly at 20 gigabytes. Okay. Uh, and this is for ambient temperature. Okay. Uh, so it's quite expensive uh, in terms of uh, the data set sizes and in terms of training time. Uh, and it becomes even more complicated when you go to higher temperatures, 933 Kelvin, for example, uh, where you have both liquid and the solid that you need to train on. Where you have to train on four, not one, one uh, snapshot, which is 20 gigabytes. Now you start testing, training it on four liquids and four solids. Um, so roughly you're training on 80 gigabytes of data that you need to move back and forth between GPUs to CPUs. And sometimes you don't even have CPU memory. You need to read files in order to do this training. So there is 8 million grid points. Uh, there are, sorry, there are 8 million grid points. And then there is an input fingerprint. A fin fingerprint. The length is about uh, 91. Um, the output LDOS is 250. And this is uh, the training. Going from the fingerprint to the LDOS is the training you're trying to do. And notice that we are doing this in each grid point. So we are making the machine learning models goal simpler. It is trying to ca capture the uh, local quantity of interest. And then we are in a second step, we are going to integrate uh, the, from LDOS, we are going to calculate the energy that we would like to do uh, using standard uh, physics approaches. Okay. And I talked about what the uh, um, network looks like. The, there is an, uh, like a, a cartoon of the network on the right side. Uh, like a compressed version. Uh, and there are a lot of training parameters if you are interested in reproducing this uh, that are listed there. Uh, the main uh, go thing is that we are used thousand grid points as a mini batch and then we train on it. And that's the uh, one thing somebody might ask. Okay. So now if you do this training and then you do a second step, which is to go from LDOS to uh, total energies, 
what would be the uh, results in order uh, for this uh, total calculation. And the goal here is to meet, yeah, and so if you did the LDOS calculation using quantum espresso or WASP, using this, and then did the integration to go to energies, uh, it would, what would be the total energy? And that is shown here in the figure as DFT LDOS targets. And the second one is to replace the first step, which is calling quantum espresso uh, to go from fingerprints to LDOS yeah, or atomic configuration to LDOS. You uh, calculate the LDOS using the fingerprints, using machine learning inference. And then second step, you use the physics approaches to go to total energies. Okay. And that's the uh, target versus the prediction. The left side shows aluminum, 10 snapshots of aluminum. It also shows the training and the validation snapshots, the no, zero and one. And uh, it also shows the eight uh, test snapshots. Uh, and you can see that it matches quite well. It's like, um, I, in terms of milli electron volts per atom, the total energy is matched quite well for the ambient temperature on the left side, okay? Now the high energy, the total energy calculation for high temperature uh, data is shown on the right. And uh, there is a partition uh, uh, line in between the, on the right side. There is a, the left side is the liquid uh, snapshots at 933 Kelvin. And the uh, right side is the solid snapshots on the 933 Kelvin. And uh, you can see that there is a variation between the liquid and the solid uh, in terms of the total energy. Okay, so if you just trained on liquid and uh, try to do the inference on solid, you get, usually you get poor performance. Uh, and uh, the, if you trained on solid and you try to, try to do inference on the liquid, you can get poor performance. So the model here is trying to use four liquid snapshots and four solid snapshots. And then you can see that it fits uh, accurately. Okay, <clears throat> the error is slightly higher compared to the room temperature, uh, but it is still uh, well within what we would like it to be. Uh, it is 26 milli electron volts per atom uh, for, uh, for the high temperature aluminum and uh, three milli electron volts for the uh, room temperature, uh, for the ambient temperature, okay? So uh, the training time is quite expensive for the uh, high temperature uh, snapshots because uh, you have to move the data, you have to move this 80 gigabytes of data around. And that's the main reason. Uh, and uh, the second reason is we are running it on two GPUs. You can scale it up. So this think of this as a proof of concept that this approach works. This is like a, uh, we've shown that this works and you can calculate total energy using this. And now you can parallelize it um, and uh, make it better and uh, scale it up as much as you want, okay? And once you have done this training, the inference time for each snapshot uh, is 45 seconds. So provided you did enough inference for enough snapshots, you can amortize the cost of the training. Uh, and of course the training cost has to be reduced, the data generation cost has to be reduced, but you can also amortize this over many, many uh, inference that you want to do for different snapshots. So that was the first portion of the talk. Um, I uh, want to jump uh, to the architecture side uh, from the application side now. Uh, and this is a project that is funded out of DOE. It's a co-design center uh, called ARIA. It is focused on machine learning accelerators primarily. And uh, the goal here is to co-design the accelerators algorithms to run on these accelerators and applications that use these algorithms, okay? There is a large team at Sandia there are uh, two partner institutions, uh, PNL, the Pacific Northwest National Labs, and Georgia Tech. Uh, the PIs from uh, PNL and Georgia Tech are uh, Roberto Giorgioza and Tushar Krishna. And the, some of the results I'm gonna show here uh, uh, is joint work with Sandia team and uh, Georgia Tech and the two students here, Hyukjun Kwan and Jiang Ojiang uh, from Georgia Tech as well. So let me start with why we are going in this direction. And the, this is a, a chart from uh, um, uh, 
OpenAI's uh, work uh, that shows the x-axis here is uh, years and the y-axis is petaflop uh, days uh, for training an AI system, okay? And uh, the, if you notice the x-axis starts in 1960, so it's quite, uh, there are decades, each uh, uh, tick is here as a decade, or actually two decades. Uh, no, sorry, decade. And uh, you are looking at training time. And if you notice, it used to increase roughly with the Moore's law, like two, 18 months to two years. Uh, it used to double uh, every uh, 18 months to two years. But something happened in 2011, 2012, after that, we've been using, uh, we've been doubling the training time that we use for AI systems roughly every four months. And using GPUs, some of this is not using GPUs, it's using TPUs or other custom accelerators in order to do the training time, in, in order to improve the training time further, but you're using a lot more and more compute in order to do this. And for example, Google just announced the ML perf results for using TPU v4. They could finish the training um, for four of the uh, eight MLPerf models in under 30 seconds. That's um, uh, really exciting for, if you look at the times that I showed before, it was like in hours, right? So it, it, it would reduce the training time by quite a bit. So we are very excited about that. And there are a lot of upcoming startups that we all work with. Uh, it is, uh, startups like Cerberus, Grafco, Rock, and Samanova. They are all designing hardware that is focused on machine learning training, inference, uh, or both, right? And, and uh, so we would like to use this hardware and we would like to co-design for this hardware. And it is not like these architectures are very different. They are different in some aspects, but they are similar in other aspects. You can call all of these accelerators spatial or data flow accelerators. And I'll show you what I mean in a minute. Okay. So if you have a spatial or data flow accelerator, uh, here is the focus for this project that uh, uh, I lead uh, along with two other PIs at Georgia Tech and PNL. The, uh, there are four objectives here. And the first is to co-design these architectures and algorithms. The second is, can we use these machine learning accelerators in some of our future DOE uh, leadership class machines that we build? And if you, the third is, if you notice these accelerators, they are mainly focused on using dense neural networks with a lot of dense data. But if you look at the science problems, we are interested in sparse problems and irregular or streaming data. So how to, um, change the architectures to for our use cases, and then finally evaluate them, right? If there are like four or five different accelerators out there, can we evaluate these accelerators for what is interest for science use cases? So those are the four objectives. And the areas that we work on are, we have simulation or analytical modeling tools. I'll show an example in the next slide uh, of hardware. Uh, we and then we picked a few applications that we want to try on this hardware, both machine learning applications and traditional applications. And then the algorithms that we design are like decades, like influenced by uh, data flow architectures a uh, few decades ago. Uh, so it'd be designed data flow algorithms on this, for this hardware. And then we actually have hardware uh, as test beds uh, are from academia uh, that we can test on. Okay, so that's the uh, entire landscape of this particular project. And I want to focus on one aspect of this, okay? So now if, if you are given a hardware, you want to evaluate that hardware and you want, and, and the, let me backtrack. Given a hardware and a kernel that you want to optimize, you want to evaluate the hardware for, uh, for different algorithms for this kernel and what are the, and find the best choices you want to make. And number one, you have to, you can pick the different algorithm and, uh, and the current algorithm we are going to pick, the problem that we are going to pick is gem here. 
which is general matrix matrix multiply. It's basically multiplying two dense matrices. These hardware is designed for this purposes. So I'm not talking about the third goal here, which is uh, doing sparse or irregular data. We are taking this hardware and try saying, this is what the hardware is designed for. But we are going to give a workload that is not a machine learning workload. We are going to give a workload that the scientific computing applications are interested in. So we are going to evaluate a gem kernel that is in the sizes that we care about, the, dim the dimensions for the gem kernel that we care about, and then evaluate them on this particular hardware, see how it works. Okay. And in order to do that, we developed an analytical model. Uh, it's called Maestro Blast, that is uh, on the bottom here. Uh, so because it is an analytical model, it is not a cyclocated simulator, it's actually quite fast. Uh, so you, it can simulate one different hardware. And we developed a mapping explorer on top of this analytical hardware, which takes a particular kernel here, the BLAS operation is um, gem, and it takes a matrix dimension. And then it can evaluate different algorithms, different tile sizes for each hardware configuration that you have using this cost model and give you an optimized mapping on how each hardware did for each workload. And I'll show you an example. Okay. So the uh, hardware that we are trying to evaluate in this particular work uh, is TPU from Google, of course, uh, NVDLA from NVIDIA, uh, and a couple of academic uh, hardware, um, which is uh, Iris and Mary from MIT and Georgia Tech and Shidi uh, from the from Google China. So we want to evaluate all of these hardware for the gem kernel. And we want to find the best algorithm, best tile sizes and cluster sizes for that particular kernel on a given hardware. And that is the goal of this project. Okay. And essentially this framework does uh, what I just described, what we put it. And here is an example. And uh, this is more of an eye chart, so you don't have to like pick into the uh, like tiny little y-axis. Uh, the goal is uh, the gem kernel is a triple, triply nested loop. You can reorder the loop in any way you want. That the loop reordering gives you uh, a different algorithm, okay? A different way you would, you're accessing it via rows, accessing it via columns, accessing that via blocks. Um, so you could reorder that. That is number one. The next is uh, you could do this one entry at a time, like a scalar entry, or you could do a block at a time. So that gives you uh, a tiled algorithm versus a non-tiled algorithm. And then you've, a lot of these accelerators have custom networks that can reduce on a certain dimension. Uh, for example, the one here, the, the shown here, the, the, the example here in the middle, uh, of course, I'll share the slides so you can carefully look at the figures, uh, can reduce uh, in across columns, okay? So these accelerators, are custom built for machine learning use cases. So uh, they, they have uh, certain hardware constraints that are uh, in there. It is in output stationary, for example. If it, if it is output stationary, then you can only do certain things when you do um, gem. Okay. And, and so now you take all of these into account. The, you take the three dimensions that I talked about. You The loop ordering is one dimension that is a different algorithm. The tile size is another dimension that gives you uh, whether you are blocking or not. And this hardware constraint, which is the reduction is the third dimension. Now you want to represent all of this uh, in a concise way so that you can take this gem algorithm that you are interested in and test it on uh, and evaluate it on uh, hardware using an analytical model. And then you find the quantity of interest you need. Okay, and the quantity of interest, the three quantities that we are interested in showing here, uh, each row, the, the bottom plot, each row here is a quantity of interest that we want. Uh, number one, it is gigaflops on the bottom, then uh, energy cost for this accelerator uh, and the runtime for this particular kernel. Okay. Each column here is a given workload. Okay. And each bar in a column is a different accelerator. Uh, so you can see, if, if you just quickly scan over it, there is no one winner, okay? Whether it is gigaflops or whether it is uh, energy cost, there is no one clear winner. It is going to completely depend on which workload you pick. 
there is some accelerator. If you pick the accelerator first, then the tile sizes and the loop orders make a huge difference in terms of how you use the accelerator. So tools like this basically helps you co-design both the algorithms to adapt to the accelerators and the accelerators designers to decide how what are the features that they want in the accelerator itself. So, and, uh, so this is a tool that we developed uh, and the, both the thing, both the topics that I discussed about on applications and on this accelerator topic, uh, the paper is in a review. One of the material science paper, we are going to post it in an archive probably within a week, even before this um, talk will be online. Okay. So with that, let me jump to a few, few challenges that I see in the last few minutes I have. Uh, and they're very related to the problems I uh, talked about earlier. Okay. Uh, so the challenge, I, I put learning to learn in course, uh, uh, science itself. Uh, it's um, uh, sort of like a generalization uh, idea that a lot of people are exploring even in uh, uh, the industry related uh, grand challenges, uh, but the science grand challenges are quite different. So what we are trying to do, the example, first example that I showed is develop a neural network architecture, special nonlinear units, find the best hyperparameter for a given data set or a given material uh, for a given temperature maybe. Uh, so whatever is your interest in, okay. And then you move to something else, then now you have to find something new. Okay? And, and we go, uh, we evaluate it again. Sometimes we could do transfer learning, uh, but still you have to uh, do all this all over again. And I'm going to make a claim that this problem we will solve it. I mean, like I showed in one example that are made examples like this. Um, we will solve this problem of finding better ML models for a given uh, material, given temperature, or uh, for a given task, okay? But the challenge is not to do that, right? The, cha the ch challenge is um, uh, yeah, going further. We want to learn uh, the structure of the tasks rather than learning each task separately. And this is the standard definition of a meta-learning problem. Um, say you want you don't want uh, uh, to predict uh, LDOS instead you want to directly predict energies. Can you learn the? Have you learned the structure of the task itself in order to use that knowledge to uh, learn um, uh, energies? And the other way to think about it is is it a it's a multi-task learning. Uh, uh, you can learn many different tasks, but you have to learn it quickly or or accurately or both, uh, as opposed to learning them ind independently. Right, that's, that's uh, another way to think about it. And that this is a huge challenge. Uh, you can see we are starting to go in this direction. Uh, like we, we didn't, uh, so if you trained on uh, uh, solid or if trained on liquid, it uh, would do quite bad. We are kind of trying to uh, find a model that works on both, uh, but we, we are still with aluminum, we are still in uh, taking baby steps here. There are a lot, there's a lot of, a lot of open challenges uh, in, in this uh, particular uh, area. The second challenge that I would like to uh, highlight is uh, uh, the science grant challenge itself. So the uh, the science grant challenge is uh, more, I'm, I'm gonna say the most of the challenges here are motivated by societal grant challenges or industry driven for image classification or natural language processing or board games. We would, uh, the, uh, and this is an easy claim, the grand challenges uh, uh, that we are interested in that are, is, are going to come out of the labs, we have to define these grand challenges and uh, uh, the focus of the community has to be on grand challenges in such a way that it is not to learn what we already know in simulation and try to fit to the simulation. It is to augment what we know on our knowledge uh, beyond what we know in this, from our traditional sim sim simulation aspects. Right. So that is uh, designing the grand challenge first and then giving benchmarks that are meaningful for our use cases, like terabytes of data, sparse data. Uh, and uh, so that when people build new accelerators, new ML benchmarks, they can utilize our grand challenges as the uh, goal. And the, it is quite useful both for academia and other labs when we have these benchmarks out there as grand challenges. And this is the last one I want to highlight. Uh, this is uh, on the compute architecture itself. 
The current approach is just use GPUs mostly. We are starting to evaluate other type of accelerators, uh, but it's mostly just starting. And we, we uh, except in places like uh, Google where they use uh, the GPUs. For uh, so uh, the goal, the problem here is we are science use cases uh, has a diverse need for the uh, for the accelerators. We could use the accelerators in the edge, like an experiment. We could use it in an experimental facility. We could have custom accelerators for training or for inference, or we could use this with a traditional HPC use case. Uh, and uh, all of them requires challenges in programming them, challenges in programming them with our simulations uh, in a portable way. And can we also use these accelerators for the non-AI workloads? So those are the uh, uh, primary challenges there. And these are all three of these are really open for anybody who's interested in this topic to come in uh, and help us. Uh, so uh, a quick summary, I talked about one application use case that we are working on, one architecture project that we are uh, working on, and I highlighted a couple of challenges. Uh, these are challenges that are interesting to me, of course. Uh, there are several other challenges in trust and uh, explainable or interpretable models, scalable software, and a lot more. So a um, lot of work to be done in this topic. I'll stop uh, there and uh, take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Siva. Um, thanks for the great talk. Let's open up for questions. Um, as before, please either raise your hand or write the questions into the chat. So there's already one question coming in by Robert Forrest. Um, so atomistic training data can be highly similar in terms of the atomic environments represented. Does sparsification enter your workflows to reduce the size of training sets? If so, which any particular sparsification methods and do they have much benefit? Yep, yep, Inter interesting, interesting question. And we are starting to look at this actually. We are uh, looking at it from a perspective of, do we have to train uh, all of this eight, I, I said this 200 by 200 by 200 grid, all of these 8 million grid points, can we train on fewer grid points instead of all of it? So, and we are also looking at it in a perspective of whether do we have to train on all the snapshots that we are training on, can we train, can we pick and choose on which train, training uh, uh, snapshots that we have to use? So we are looking at it from both perspective. Uh, the, the one approach that we took was we find uh, the PCA uh, between uh, different snapshots uh, and we also look at the fingerprints and try to cluster them. So those are the two approaches that we are looking at. So using some sort of clustering approach of the fingerprints themselves, and then choosing only a few uh, of the grid points per cluster. Uh, and it helped us in doing the hyperparameter tuning. It, uh, I didn't talk about it, but it definitely helped us in terms of uh, hyperparameter tuning. So we didn't use all the data for hyperparameter tuning. More questions. Hi, can I ask a question, please? please go Hi, ahead. Thank, thank, thank you, she was for a very nice talk. Uh, so my question is on the first part, application session, where you were talking about that uh, the learning part is very expensive because of the moving of data. And I was, so can you comment why did you choose this plain wave code uh, and not uh, a code um, uh, with localized basis set, which could have been uh, lesser in terms of memory. So training could have been a bit cheaper. Yeah, okay. So uh, let me paraphrase my answer with a uh, caveat. I am not a material scientist, I'm a computer scientist. So I go with uh, what is recommended by the material scientists uh, in the team. Uh, so that is the easy answer. But uh, the trickier one is we were going for uh, uh, number one, uh, of one part that I didn't talk about is how difficult was it for us to generate the LDOS uh, uh, values that we wanted uh, uh, to train on the output values. Mm -hmm. And it was, we wanted it to be quite accurate so that 
calculating the energies from that, uh, we, we are able to calculate the energy from that accurately. And so uh, the choices were made for mainly for accuracy uh, at this mm -hmm. stage. Uh, and uh, we could find other trade-offs uh, like you find out uh, to make it go faster. Uh, but I don't know the implications in terms of the accuracy. I, uh, uh, but we can definitely chat offline and uh, we, I can put you in touch with the material scientists in the team. Okay, yeah, thank you. And just follow up to the, that question, let's say if we take, uh, so coming uh, to the point of accuracy, so I know if you have plane wave basis set, so it could be more accurate. So let's, talk, let's say we use the, the, this numerical orbitals to train our, um, to train, and then we uh, want to test how good they are when we use the plane wave, uh, comparing it with the plane wave. So do you think that the, the, the training would would have been different uh, if you train on a uh, some cheaper and then use for a. Uh, so do you want you from what you described? It looks like you want to train on a different. Um, yeah. Let's say the, the, the simulation package. Uh, try, different. Try, yeah, a different simulation package. Uh, of course, that um, uh, your output is going to uh, change and. That, that for the train data. So you might have to retrain, but provided there is enough agreement between these different codes, mm -hmm. uh, say for example, you could use uh, the previous hyperparameters and weights as starting mm -hmm. point and probably you converge faster. Uh, it, it's going to depend on the agreement between these two codes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, Siva, thank you again very much for, for this talk and for the insights. Um, we will continue tomorrow at 10 a.m. We have the next talk by Miguel Maheka. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks again, Siva, for giving the presentation. And uh, have a nice day or evening, depending on where you are. <laughs> thank you.